Paul speaking, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Amen. Father God, we thank you for this wonderful time that we've had in service. And we've been able to sing and worship and glorify your name. And blessed by the children who were here today that were able to sing as well. And Father, now we come to a time where we want to hear from you. Where we want to still our hearts and our minds and our thoughts. And be able to have your word penetrate our hearts. And so Lord, I ask that you would speak to each and every one of us starting with me. As we gather here today to hear your word, that you would convict us in those areas where we need conviction, that you would break down walls that need to be broken down and break chains that need to be breaking and uplift spirits that may be down, that there would be spiritual and physical healing, that your work would be done and your will would be done according to your purpose and plan today, that there be nothing that be a hindrance for what you want to happen here today. And we ask this in Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. And you may be seated. For those who were in the class on Friday evening, um, some of what I'm going to share today, you might say, hey, we just talked about that on Friday. It, and it wasn't planned that way. I've been working on this, and then we went to that class and had that lesson and had that video that we watched. I'm thinking, Lord, you want me to change or something different here? But no, this is just the way God works. Several weeks ago, we had spent some time looking at the Gospel of Mark. And during that time, I'm just thinking and asking and meditating on the Word of God and asking God, what are we going to be speaking about? What do you want me to bring? And then praying for, for each other and praying for my own life and situations that are going on and things that are happening. And as I'm just spending time meditating and thinking and praying, this thought comes across my head, my, head, my mind. Broken, but not useless. And so I thought, okay, okay you know, broken but not useless, and I am start talking to God, but that just kept resonating in my mind. And it's been on my mind for several weeks now. And I thought, you know, things break all the time. Things break for many reasons. You know, furniture breaks, things in our homes break, appliances break, our cars break, clothing breaks, our bodies break down. Things break all the time. And what we do is we buy a replacement part or we do a repair or we try to fix it so that it gets back to where it's supposed to be. When it's broken, it's not in its an original state. It's not the way it was meant to be or the way it was designed. Things break all the time. Our cars break down. All the time, things are breaking. And we try to fix those things. Just a few weeks ago, on a Saturday morning, I came and Ed and the team were doing the Food Alliance ministry, and they do a wonderful job. And part of the ministry is that they prepare the food, that they prepare things for folks to come and be able to, to get groceries. But before they start distributing that, they go out and they share the gospel. And they let folks know why we do what we do and why we're here. It's not about us. It's not about this building. It's about the love that God has put in us that we're able to share with others. And that God has blessed us so that we can be used by God to bless others. And that morning when I came, uh, you know, Ed was, was kind of putting stuff in order and, and the team was getting ready. And when I came up to him, he looked a little, um, I won't say frantic, but there was just a look in his eye. And I said, hey, brother, what's going on? And he says, oh, we got a problem. And, this is, and I'm trying to, to get this because it was about time to start sharing the gospel and praying for people. And I said, what's the problem? He said, well, we had a major leak in the, in the other building. And I said, what happened? The water here? He goes, well, the hose. And so he said, I called Frank, and, and, and Frank's going to come try to help. And I said, well, let's go take a look. And we looked. It was a hose. And I said, if I had some tools, I could take care of it. And so I said, call Frank. We got it. No problem. You go take care of the ministry. I'll take care of this. We fixed it. It was a hose. It broke. They did. We did what we had to do. We replaced the part. We're all good. Things break. It happens all the time. Sometimes things break, though, where it's beyond repair. If you drop a glass or a mirror and it shatters into thousands of pieces, you're not going to be able to put that back together. And there's things that break that we just want to hold on to. It has a sentimental value or, or it's just something that we say, you know what, I'm going to get to that. I'm going to fix that. Let me just set it aside. 
You know, we all have a junk drawer at our house where we have stuff that we put in there. And maybe we have a, a junk garage where we have a bunch of stuff that we figure we're going to get back and take care of those things and fix those things. You know, and, and, we, and we hold on to stuff for a certain reason. But the thing, the reason why things break is because they get aged. It's because they're misused. It's because we, they exceed the life expectancy, if you will, of that product or that item. It's because it's put under an amount of stress or pressure that it wasn't designed to work under. If you ask an electrician and, and, and you ask them, hey, we're just going to run this wire, they're going to say, well, what gauge is that wire? Because depending on the amount of electricity you want running through that wire to get the electricity to the other end, if it's a light or some appliance or something, that wire has to be the right gauge. So if not, you can put a surge to it and then ruin what's on the other side and fry the wire and cause all kinds of problems. So things may be used in a way that they were not designed to be used and they break. And as I thought about that, I said, you know, that's us. As human beings, we're, we're broken. We're flawed. We're not in the original design that God intended for us. Sin has come in and has broken us and has made us flawed and made us different than what we were supposed to be. And we're all broken, but we're not useless. Not by any stretch of the imagination. All humans are broken, and that's what sin does. And we're in this fallen world and sinful world. And what the world says is, look, you, yeah, you're bad. And you're, something's not right. But you're not as bad as so-and-so. Right? And it starts to, to work on us to justify our condition. Well, you might be bad. You may say things and you may act in ways. But you're not as bad as him. Or you're not as bad as her. So you don't feel so bad. And it's like, okay. I may have done this, but look at what they did. I'm not that bad. I'm not that broken. And the world tries to make us feel comfortable with our sin and comfortable with not needing repentance and comfortable with, with being in that state. Christians are not perfect. Christians are not perfect. We're just forgiven. And we're on this path to perfection. And we're on this path of being made right and being restored to what the original design was. And we're going to say things. We're going to do things. We're going to have attitudes. We're going to have agendas. I will fail. You will fail. We'll say and do things that are not right, that are going to offend people, that are going to upset people. Because we're in this fallen world. Sometimes it's, it's intentional that people go out to do something like that. But most of the times it's not. But because we're in this sinful nature in this fallen world, we're broken, and we do things that we shouldn't do. And many of us as Christians, we look, and the world looks at the Bible and looks at these people that were in the Bible and say, wow, man, those guys and those ladies, I mean, they did amazing things. They must have been so good that, that they just were incredible that God used them. And certainly the Bible is full of stories of men and women that were used in a mighty and a powerful way, who were involved in amazing feats and who were part of this incredible journey and this incredible story. And people maybe look at them and say, wow, they were great people. They were broken and flawed just as you and me are. Just as we are broken and flawed, so were these individuals. Let's look at some examples of some of these people. Biblical people that were held in high regard, and are still, for the feats that they were in or the things they did. But look at this. Genesis chapter 12. Now, there was a famine in the land that Abram went down, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarah, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but let you live. Say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. The situation was that Abram and his wife are in this land, that a great famine, this great 
the catastrophe comes and people are starving to death and the only place that they can go to find food is in Egypt. And so they're going to go to Egypt and they make that journey. And as they're ready to go in, Abram says, wait a minute. You know, you're my wife. And he says something that all wives want to hear. You are beautiful. You are beautiful. You're so beautiful that my life is at stake, honey. (laughs) You're so gorgeous that if we go into Egypt, the officials are going to see how beautiful you are. And they're going to want you. And in those days, unfortunately, the women were treated like property. And so the thought was that if the, if the officials, the, the pharaohs or any government officials wanted his wife, they'd have to fix that situation of her being available. And the only way to do that was to kill him. And he knew that. So he says, honey, you're so beautiful. Oh, gorgeous. But if we go in and they know that you're my wife, they're going to kill me. So let's lie. Let's make this pact that we're going to lie and say you're my sister so that that... Things go well for me. I mean, I, I, because I'm your brother, they're going to want favor with me, so they're going to take care of me, and then you'll be taken care of because of your beauty. Look, I got it all worked out. This is going to be great. They go into the land. They present that story. And then in the Pharaoh's house, there's these diseases and rashes and things that start happening. The Pharaoh goes, wait a minute, what's going on here? And he goes to Abram, and then the lie is revealed. The truth came out. They were liars. And yet God used them for an amazing story as part of God's plan. Later in Genesis, God says this, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram, but you will be called Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. Somebody who was flawed and broken and lied and conspired to hide something, that's who God chose as a vessel to be the father of many nations. And if you look at that text in in chapter 17, it's all on God. This is my covenant, not on you. You're broken. You're flawed. But this is my covenant. And because of that, I'm going to change your name because you're no longer going to be that broken and flawed person. I'm giving you a new name. Amazing. Even though, they saw, even though they sinned by lying and even though they tried to conspire and hide something to save their situation, because of God's perfect plan, he was going to work through these broken people. Look at Moses. Moses, who is a large figure in the Jewish community, Moses, who is a, this pillar, this amazing man, was a murderer. If we look at Exodus chapter 2, starting verse 11, it says, One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Glancing this way and that way and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Moses, who is held as this example, this leader, this incredible man, was a murderer. And at that time, he looked around and said, well, this is, this is wrong, so I'm going to enact my justice. He wasn't defending himself. He didn't murder because of self-defense. He didn't murder because he was protecting. He just saw a wrong, and he took action. He looked. He knew it was wrong because he looked this way. He looked that way. Tried to make sure there was no witnesses. Right? Then he tried to hide the body. He didn't look up. Because God was watching. And God saw him. He was a murderer. And yet that is the man that God chose to send to Pharaoh. Exodus chapter 3 verse 10 says, So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring out my people out of Egypt. You're a murderer, but I'm going to work through you. And Moses has this debate. He has this argument with God. And he starts saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're calling me? Do you know who I am? Do you know what I've done? I'm not qualified. I don't have the the, the qualifications. I haven't done the study. I don't know what I'm supposed to do here. 
you're asking me to go to Pharaoh. I don't know how to bait. I, I don't know how to deal with his people. I don't know all the politics. I don't know how to do. I'm the wrong guy. Look, I'm stuttering here because I can't even speak. And God says, I know. I know who you are. I knew you before you knew you. I knew what you were going to do. I was there. I saw. Now go. Because I work through broken. I work through messed up. I work in a way that you don't understand. And you're not going to do the work. It's me. Now go. Moses was trying to find a way to get out of that. But no. See, it's God who does the work. And God works through these broken vessels, these flawed individuals, these sinners and messed up people. Throughout the Bible, we see all these examples. Jacob was a con man and a liar. Jonah hated people so much, he wanted God to wipe out the Ninevites. Just take them off, Lord. King David was an adulterer and a murderer. Rahab was a prostitute. Mark, who wrote the gospel of Mark, one of the accounts that we looked at, was a quitter. He gave up. We don't know why, but he gave up. Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. Peter denied Christ. The guy who took the sword and hacked off the ear when they came for Christ later says, uh, who? Uh, mm, no, don't know the guy. It wasn't me. I wasn't there. Denies the Lord. Matthew, being a tax collector, was probably taking a little extra for his own personal handling fees that he had to do the work he had to do. Disciples James and John wanted Jesus to send fire from heaven and wipe out the, the, the um, Samaritans. Throughout the Bible, we see these amazing stories of these individuals who did great things, and we look and say, wow, if I could be like them, you are. You're broken and flawed like they were. <laughs> Just like they were, we are today. And in Hebrews, the author writes this chapter 11 where he dedicates time to talking about these individuals who we look back and said, what amazing things they did. What an incredible adventure, how they were used, and, and the things that they were able to accomplish. It was what God accomplished through them. And I bet each one of those people, when God called them and asked them to get involved and to do something they had the same response. Me? No, Lord, you don't know who I am. Let me help you understand. This is, this is what I did. This is how I spoke. This is, this is where I come from. I, I, I'm an alcoholic. I'm a drug addict. I'm this. I'm that. I've been in prison. And, and God says, I know. I'm in the business of fixing broken. That's what I do. As broken and flawed people, God wants to work through us. God wants to pour his spirit in us. This amazing treasure, this story of love and compassion and forgiveness in us so that others get to know the Lord that we serve. God didn't pick these people because they had a great skill set or because they had these extreme qualifications or because in God's plan something was lacking. No, God picked these people because he has the great plan. He has the qualifications. He has the skill set. And there was something lacking in them as there is in us. Paul was another example of a broken person that God used. If you remember the story of Paul, we've spoken about him many times. And before he was Paul, he was Saul. And his only mission in life and his only desire in life was to stop the church. Think about that. He wanted to stop the spreading of the way. That's what they called it. The teachings of Jesus. The ways of Jesus. His only passion and desire was to stop that from happening. That's all he cared about. Look what Acts chapter 8 says. And Saul was there giving his approval to his death. On that day a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. All except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. What had happened was that Stephen gave this message and he was testifying and he was speaking about God. And all the Sanhedrin, all the religious parties and all the leaders were so angry at him 
that they stoned him to death right there. And Saul was witnessing this. And when it says he's given his approval, he said, hey, guys, wait a minute. You're going to, great, let me hold your robes. Let me hold your jackets. Let me, because you don't want that impeding your arm to get that, you know, get that rock and that robe might hold your back. So let, let me hold your robe. Don't want you to tear a rotator cuff when you're doing this, right? He was there and he was encouraging and he was excited about what they were doing. Verse 3 says, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them into prison. Talk about mission impossible. He wanted to stop the church. Talk about broken and flawed and being misguided and not understanding. He wanted to take everybody and anybody who was following Jesus and listening to Jesus and wanting to do the things that Jesus said, and he wanted to put them in prison to beat them or kill them. And that's the one that God chose to take his gospel to the Gentile world. God's in the business of working through broken. God doesn't care what has happened. God doesn't, he doesn't, whatever has been said and done and how you live doesn't matter because when God fills you and God gets you and God changes you, God now has a different plan and a purpose for you. And whatever was, was. It's what is and is going to be that matters. Paul, now, after spending time with Jesus, he starts these missionary trips, and he's taking now the gospel, the one that he was fighting against and trying to stop, and he's teaching it and preaching it and giving messages and encouraging people and disciplining or uh, discipling people and working with them so that they can continue to do the same thing. And he writes these letters to different places in the region where he's gone. And he writes 1 Corinthians where he's dealing with some things that are going on within the church. They were believing traditions and customs over the things of God, and there was this conflict that was going on, so he writes this letter. And it's believed that between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, there's about a year span when he writes 2 Corinthians. Because what happened was, as many in the church were saying, well, who was Paul? Who gave him the authority? What, this ministry that he has, where did it come from? And, and what is his motive, Really? Why is he doing this? Why is he writing these things? And that's really what he's addressing in 2 Corinthians. But look what he says in 1 Corinthians. Starting in chapter 2, he says, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquent speech or superior wisdom, as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing except Christ and him crucified. He's saying, look, when I came to you and I was spoke with you guys, I didn't use those six, seven, and eight-syllable words that you had no understanding. I didn't come with all my doctorates and all my degrees. I didn't come telling you the things that I've accomplished. I didn't come to tell you what I have done. No, I just came with the testimony of God, of what Jesus has done and what he's doing in my life. And that's all I want to know. Christ crucified. Because through that crucifixion, there was a resurrection. And through that resurrection, I now have eternal life in him because of what he did. Not me or what I have done. He goes and he says, I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power. I didn't come with one-liners. I didn't come with these cute stories. I didn't come with these these stories that tug on your heart and, and wanted to get emotional. I just came with the, just the simple gospel, the truth about Jesus Christ. It doesn't need anything else. It just, it is the truth. It is him. And so that's what I was sharing with you. And this is why. Verse 5, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. That is where our faith needs to be grounded. That's why we encourage you all the time, get in the word. Get into a small group. Check out what we say. Don't listen to me because I'm, I'm flawed. I'm broken. I'm going to let you down. I don't want to tell you about what I did or what David did because what David did was not good. What, how David lived was not right. But I want to tell you about Jesus who came into broken David and is working in me and changing me and molding me and reminding me of the things. And when I'm, I'm going off course, the Holy Spirit says, hey, wait a minute, mijo, over here. 
Uh uh-uh, uh, not that. And when I'm wrong, he, I feel grieved and I said, Lord, forgive me for what I said, forgive me for what I did. Not perfect, just forgiven. But he chooses us to work in us. That's what Paul's saying, so that your faith rests on the word of God. The word of God. He's saying, my preaching wasn't about the things that I did or even the people that are with me. I have nothing to brag about. Although he could have. You know the story. He said, during my time, I've been shipwrecked. I've been beaten. I've been stoned. I've been whipped. I've been hungry, been cold, been left for dead. I've been in prison been rejected, been laughed at, mocked at, all that. But you know what? It doesn't matter. Don't focus on that. Focus on why I'm doing it. It's because Jesus. It's because of what he has done. And he begins to write, and he's, Paul is saying, he's, he, it's what God is doing in my life. And he's writing his story on my heart. He's writing his story in my life. Because he wants you to know what he is doing. Don't focus on what I have done. He goes on in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and he says, You yourselves are our letter, written in our hearts, known and read by everyone. The ministry that I have, the things that I'm saying, the things that I'm preaching, it, it's on your heart, but it's because of what God's writing on your heart. It's his story being written, and you're like a letter. And he says what? Read by everyone. That means it's read by Christians and non-Christians. The Bible was written to God's people. It's for everyone to read and everyone to understand, but it was written for God's people. And so when the world reads the Bible, they read poems, they read stories. They don't understand that this is the word of God. But when we come to know God, now there's a difference. The spirit comes into us and now we understand his word. And now we understand that every word that's in the Bible is God speaking to us. That is him telling us about his love for us. And What Paul is saying here is that your letters and you're being read by everyone. And sometimes we don't remember that. We don't recognize and realize that the world is watching. If they know you're a Christian, they're watching. In the community, at the workplace, in your home, wherever you go, people are watching. And they're seeing how you react and what you say and what you do. In our Experiencing God class, and I asked this gentleman if I can share this story, this man, one of the guys, the brothers are there, he, he was sharing as we start off and we share testimonies. And he was saying how, uh, how his boss looks at him and says, hey, man, you're different, right? And later in the evening, we were talking and he says, you know, I want that. I, I, I want the Holy Spirit. I want that just that feeling. I want that on me. And, 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 and then somebody starts speaking. He goes, see, that's what I want. Look at how she's talking. I mean, she's lit up, and, and I want that. And I said, brother, you already have it. He goes, what? And I said, by your own testimony, you just said your boss told you that you're different. You're not the guy he knew before. You're not, not reacting to things the way you used to react. That something is happening in your life. And everyone sees it. Your boss, because he's your boss, is the bold one that came and told you. The world is watching how we live. The world is watching how we act. And Paul continues in verse 3 and he says, You show that you are a letter from Christ. The result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence we have through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves, To claim anything for ourselves, but our competency comes from the Lord. Paul is saying, look, this ministry we have, God has asked us to do these things. Because he's working through us. As flawed and broken as we were, as messed up as we were, as we're going to make mistakes and say things and do things, he's the one that's working through us. And he wants everyone to know that. And the competency that Paul is speaking about here, this word in Greek... Uh, It comes from this root word of haiko, and it's meaning able and sufficient. Now, common sense. You say, well, somebody who's competent is able and capable or sufficient to do that. When you apply for a job, 
when you go to an interview, that process is for the person who's interviewing you to see if you have the qualifications and if you have the ability to do the job that you are applying for. In some jobs, you have to fill out an, an exam, and it's a competency test to see if you really know the product or the material or the information that you say you know, and if you are competent and if you are able to do the job that they want you to do. But in Greek, it is so much more. In Greek, it's more profound. It's, it's more in-depth. This word of competency is to arrive in the fullness, to be more than ample. It means to be more than sufficient in word and deed and in character. The Greeks, when they looked at this word, it means that in all forms, you were able, not only in content, but in being good enough and being great enough and being wide enough and being depth enough and being large enough, in being sufficient enough and worthy enough beyond that task. It's the same worthiness that John the Baptist used. When John says, hey, there's one coming who is greater than me that I'm not even worthy enough. I'm not competent. I'm not capable. I'm not able to get down and untie his sandals. That's what Paul was saying here. When you understand that Paul is saying, look, we are completely inept. There's nothing good in us. There's no way we can do this. It doesn't come from us. It comes from God. Because he's perfect. He's God. He's more than sufficient. He's more than capable. He's more than, than anything that he is who he is. But he has chosen to work through these flawed vessels to be known. The Amplified Bible says this same verse in this way. Not that we are sufficiently qualified in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency and qualifications come from God. That's what Paul was saying. I mean, I hope you can see the, the, the depth of this and, and, and how critical this one verse was that Paul used here in verse 5. That you can understand that, that it is really profound what he's saying. It's, it's not about us because we are so other than God. You know, God could choose any way, any method to reveal himself to mankind. God could decide one day that he's going to crack the sky open and say, I'm God, you're not. God could take and, and, and unfold the globe and make it a flat surface where everyone is facing in one direction. He can say, yep, it's me. He could take over all the social media websites and all the televisions and radios and all be one channel and say, hello, the holy one here, and you're not. He could use any method he wants to show his splendor and his majesty and his glory but he chose to do that through broken, flawed vessels to be able to reveal himself to mankind. That's amazing. You think about that amazing thought that through our messed up and broken lives, this amazing God wants to pour himself into us. That's why Paul in verse 4, or excuse me, chapter 4, verse 7 says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay, to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Broken, but not useless. Messed up, but of great value because of what's in us. God is amazing. Paul used that because uh, clay jars were very common. When he used that, people understood. See, people knew that clay jars, things made of clay, had three characteristics. One they were very common. Two, they were fragile. And three, they were molded by someone's hands. What a picture for us. The world is full of people. All different nations, tribes, tongues. People, human beings. But we're fragile. We're broken. And there's a creator who wants to mold us into a new creation. When Paul uses this picture, he's letting everyone know it's not me, it's not the people I'm with. All of us are broken, and all of us are like jars of clay that have this amazing blessing that can be put into us. People use jars of clay for all kinds of things. Carry water, wine, bread, grain. They would put their treasure in those things. They would hide their money and coins in that. 
But they also understood that, you know what, if, if I don't take care of that, it can break. I can lose everything that's in it. They also understood that it was fragile. And they knew that someone had formed that jar or that bowl of clay. We are made in the image of God, fearfully and wonderfully made. And in this life, we live this life that is fragile because at any moment something could happen. And we can walk a walk where we think that tomorrow we're going to do this and next week we're going to do this. But if we are not in the hands of the Almighty, we can slip into eternity and be apart from the Almighty forever and ever. And in these jars of clay, God wants to deposit his spirit. I mean, think of that. God Almighty, the creator, wants to live and reside in you and in me and in our broken lives. And we may say, but I, I'm not capable of doing that. I, I don't deserve that. I, don't, I can't be that person. I mean, look at these people. Look at the great things they did. You're right. Not one of us is worthy or competent or capable. But because of him being deposited in us. And what was that great treasure? 2 Corinthians 4, verse 5 and 6 says, For what we preach is not ourselves, but Christ, but Jesus Christ our Lord, and, our, and ourselves as servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of knowledge of God. Glory displayed in the face of Christ. The light of God. Jesus, the Spirit of God in us. When we come to know God, he says, okay, clean it out. Now I'm here. The person you were, no longer. The things you did, yeah, they happened, but that's not who you're going to be now. The way you lived, you're living a different life now. And we may say, I'm not capable of doing this, or I'm not capable of doing that, or I, don't, I, I can't do, I'd love to do that, but because of how I used to live or how I, you're, it's God who's going to do it, not you, not me. Many of us ask God, why do you have me here? Why am I here, Lord? Because I have a purpose and a plan. And in this jar of clay, I am depositing this great treasure, and I'm going to work so that others will know. This morning as I close, we have, there might be some of us here today who feel that we're broken. Feel we're not worthy. We might feel because of the way we live, the person that we, we were, the things we said, the, the things that we were involved in, that, that we just need to sit in the back and not be involved in things. And that's enough. No. No, God has a great treasure that he wants to put in you. And he's already put in you. And he wants to use you and he's shaping and molding and building in the same way he did all the great people that we read about in the Bible. Taking you through his experiences, taking you through things in life and, and using those to build your character and to build you up to be used for his honor and for his glory. Because it's not about us. We're broken. But we're not useless. God wants to use each and every one of us. Remember what the Lord Jesus said before he left. After he had been crucified and rose and he spent time with the people and he spent time with the disciples, he said this in Acts chapter 1. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and unto the ends of the earth. He says you're broken, but you're not useless. And look what he says, you will. It's not an if or maybe or a kind of. Or, well, you know, if you put enough time and you work or if you study hard enough or... No, he says you will. You will receive that. And you will be witnesses. Living a life that shows this world that, yes, I'm broken. Yes, I'm flawed. But the one who's in me is perfect. The one who shines through me is flawless. The one who shines to me is my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the one I want you to follow. He's the one that can fix broken. He's the one who can change lives. And that's what I want you to know. We live our lives to give God honor and glory. 
We live our lives to give God honor and glory and to let others know that we may be broken, but we're not useless. Amen? Let's pray.